okay? And what Mike Love thinks, what Smokey Robinson thinks, what Sting thinks, what anybody thinks, that's their business. And if they want to make their opinions known, they should make their opinions known, okay? I'm not, I'm not interested in arm wrestling with these people. At this point, uh, I'm doing what I can as a private citizen to say what I think, and um, if they are going to try and put this across on the United States uh, population, they're not going to be able to do it as easy as they thought they would. How is it going to hurt you to have an R rating on your album? Well, the main thing that it's not just me, it's going to hurt anybody. How is it going to hurt anybody? Okay. Uh, certain record companies have already backed out of the RIAA plan because they've been told by Sears, J.C. Penney's, that if you send me an album with any sticker on it, we're not going to rack it. And so A&M backed out, Geffen backed out, and MCA backed out. If you can't get it into the store, how can you sell it? That's how it can hurt you. Camelot, which is a chain of record retail outlet places in shopping malls, have been told by their uh, landlords, if you rack this stuff, you're not going to get your lease. They're not going to renew the lease. So there's a lot of pressure in the marketplace. I mean, the, the ladies, maybe they have good intentions. I don't know. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. But the net result of their tactics is somewhat chaotic. And it's not over yet. Just because the hearing was on the 19th, that doesn't mean we had an argument and everybody went away. There's still stuff going on. In the 1950s, a young man came out, appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show. They had to shoot him from the waist up. His name was Elvis Presley. In the 70s, there was a song, Louie Louie by the Kingsman. That was checked for objectionable lyrics. Uh, it went on to Spiro Agnew talking about the drug culture. Where will it end? We'll pick up on that when we come back. special for you on U68 and the topic of course is should music be rated? Will music be rated? Can it survive? Our guest today is Frank Zappa and what we were discussing going into the break was back in the 1950s when Elvis Presley appeared on the Ed Sullivan show. The camera took him from the waist up because of the hip gyrations. In the 1960s it was Louie Louie by the Kingsman. There was a question about the lyrics in that. In the 1970s, there was an awful lot of objection, particularly by then Vice President Spiro Agnew, talking about the drug culture and what it was doing to people through music. And now in the 1980s, we're worried about explicit music, objectionable words within uh, music and lyrics. And the question is, to Frank Zappa, that I have, is the things have gotten progressively worse from the decades, from the 50s through the 80s, as far as what people are objecting to. What's going to happen in the 90s? Look. The songs reflect what's going on in the society. Let's just say that if you think the lyrics are uglier today, look around you. The world is uglier than it was in 1950, okay? And I think that if you find lyrics objectionable in songs and you find that the material is harsh and you can't take listening to it, maybe the better way to fix it is to fix your world. And then these guys who write songs won't keep reminding you of how ugly stuff really is. Should artists police themselves? No. Not at all. That's not an artist's job. What are you going to do? Oh, I got an idea. I see the world. It's ugly. I'm going to put my hand over my mouth and smack my hand. No. If you're really an artist, you've got a right to not only say what you think, but you have an obligation to share that as a piece of art with the people who might benefit from hearing that point of view. Because artists provide a point of view that news people never will. Isn't it kind of a vicious circle, however? Doesn't one artist perhaps see what's selling for another artist and perhaps kind of copy? That's not art. That's commerce. Well, how many people are commerce and not artists then within the industry? Well, the industry basically is a commercial industry. I mean, if you're talking about art, I think that what I do is art because my motivation has got nothing to do with going out there and having a hit record. And I got a track record to prove that of 20 years. But there are people... Uh, that you may have, ne have never even heard of because they haven't had any hit records either. They believe in what they're doing. They want to just make music. They want to write their own songs. They want to say what's on their mind. They have a right to do it. Okay? And they shouldn't wake up every day and say, well, how am I going to police myself in order to please Tipper Gore so what's or the Susan answer? Baker? The answer is, these people have a non-issue here. The answer is, if you are concerned about uh, social conditions, don't blame it on rock and roll. The blame does not go there. Take responsibility in your own home for your own children and reinvestigate what it's going to take to make the United States school system into something that really educates rather than an enormous warehousing system for people with mysterious hair. You know, put some bucks into that. And let's, you know, you want to take care of the kids? 
The kids spend time in school, they spend time at home. And you shouldn't neglect the idea of what they do in their recreational hours. Some cities try and punish the young people in the town by refusing to put up uh, facilities that give the kids a chance to hear music in comfort. I mean, w have you ever heard of an American city that wanted to build a facility where you could go to see a rock concert, which is what kids do like to do, a rock concert with good acoustics, clean toilets, and safe facilities? Be concerned about kids? Take care of the things that kids like and things they like to do. Make that part of their life more enjoyable. Don't treat them as just this blob of potential consumers with no rights, because remember, they do have rights. They can vote. But at know? that point, shouldn't you then refuse to do a concert in an area that doesn't measure up to your specifications? You can't, because there aren't any. There, there are none? None. There are well, none in this country? Well, I can name one, and that's the Universal Amphitheater in uh, Los Angeles, which is a rare, rare case. Have you walked into some places where you've been performing and wonder why you're there? Well, I know why I'm there, but I also know the reasons why the facilities are so crappy. And since I can't do anything to change that other than talk about it and advise people that if they want to... Well, can't uh, you change? Can't you help change by talking about it? That's what I'm doing right do you, now. I, do you think your point will get across, however? Depends on who's watching and whether or not they have a can of beer in their hand or a needle in their arm or a spoon up their nose. You know, if you have any of those things happening to you, stop it. You know, take it out and think about uh, your community. I mean, I presume that most of the people who are watching this are kids not their parents. Mm -hmm. If their parents are happening to watch, you know, just think about this. When you're considering what you're going to vote for and spend your money on in a local election for bond issues and things like that, it is a false economy to save money on schools. You have to pay teachers what they're worth and you have to pay better salaries so that you get better teachers. Because the better teachers are going to make life better for you as a parent as your children grow up and they can earn more money and they can have a happier life they're the ones who are going to be taking care of you when you're old, okay? Think of it from a selfish point of view like that. Also think that the, the kids have a right to a good education. I'm 44 years old. I, I wouldn't say that the school I went to was fabulous, but even as mediocre as it was, it, it's compared to today's schools, I got a billion dollar education. Mm -hmm. I got out of school and I can spell, I can count, I can read, you know? Well, that's New Jersey's taking the lead in that respect. They've just passed a law for minimum salaries. That's a whole new story. There have been some unusual teams in the past. We could start with the 1969 New York Mets. We could go to the Cleveland Cavaliers of the late 70s. However, perhaps the most unusual team I've ever heard of is Frank Zappa, along with uh, Donny Osmond. We can throw in John Denver. We can also add Dee Snyder. Did that kind of blow your mind? Teamwork on that level? Well, no. I think that uh, no matter what a guy does for a living or how his hair is or what kind of clothes he wears, has nothing to do whether or not the man has logic going. Were you and not surprised by the logic that they professed? I was delighted rather than surprised. I mean, I didn't. when John Denver was coming in there to testify, nobody knew what he was going to say. And I know all the senators had their fingers crossed that he was going to be on their side. And he, I'm sure he caused them discomfort when he compared what was going on in the Senate to Nazi Germany. Or not in the Senate, but in the, the rating business. Mm -hmm. He made a comparison to Nazi Germany, which disturbed them. And when Dee Snyder said that the bondage is all in Tipper Gore's mind, I think that the point was very well taken. And when Donny Osmond on television says, uh, if you have these ratings, I'm going to have to put dirty stuff in my record so that I can uh, you know, make it sell better. I don't a think surprise from Mr. Clean, his reputation. He's a nice guy. I'd never met him before, but after the show, um, see, when the, the way the show was set up, I was in one little room, he was in another little room, and Candy Stroud was in Washington, D.C. with a bookcase behind her. You know, like, she's the real world with these two criminals over on the West Coast. And, uh, in fact, the room that I was sitting in had this white rag on the wall. It was somebody's office, and Donny Osmond was in the hall with the presidential blue background. They had filtered my microphone to make me sound like Billy Barty. They really had to figure out who was going to be the bad guy, who's the clean guy, and who's the right person. And it didn't work out that way, you know? I mean, think of this. Suppose you go on Nightline and Ted Koppel says to you twice in the show, well, Mr. Zappa, you're an intelligent man. Isn't that the equivalent of putting the pointed white paper hat on your head, you know, twice in one show? So it was a little bit weird, and, and uh, after the show, Donnie comes in and 